Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning in the States. Warm welcome to our GMF expert briefing on the future relations between the United States and its Central and Eastern European partners. With the notable exception of some capitals, the win of President-elect Biden was widely perceived in Central and Eastern Europe with great relief and hope that predictability and stability might soon return in the transatlantic relations. But parallel to this, partners all around the region try to puzzle out what can be expected from the new US administration. How will continuity and change shape future relations? And whether the US will pursue new approaches and focus areas? We will discuss these and other questions with GMF's best experts on the topic with Michal Baranowski, Jörg Forbrig, Alina Inayek, and Jonathan Katz. Briefly introducing our today's speakers, Michal Baranowski is director of GMF's Warsaw office and an outspoken expert in the fields of security and defense. Aside of Poland, Michal's work also covers the Visegrad countries and the Baltic states, and he's also a member of the Polish-German reflection group established by the presidents of the two countries. Jörg Forbrig is GMF's director for Central and Eastern Europe, and in his quality, he also leads GMF's Belarus front. Jörg joined GMF in 2002 and has extensive experience at the field of democracy assistance and civil society support throughout the whole region. He also serves as GMF top expert on Belarus. Alina Inayek is the director of GMF's Bucharest office and its Black Sea Trust Fund since 2007. Alina has also nearly three decades long experience with international development, democratization and civil society assistance and serves as GMF's top expert in Romania, Bulgaria and Moldova. And Jonathan Katz is GMF's director for democracy initiatives and one of the key movers and shakers in Washington DC regarding Central and Eastern European affairs. Prior to joining GMF in 2017, Jonathan held key positions in USAID, the State Department, and the Congress of the United States. My name is Daniel Hegedusch, and I serve as Fellow for Central Europe at GMF. Regarding the housekeeping rules, the initial statements of our speakers will be limited to 10 minutes, the second half of the webinar being devoted to the Q&A and discussion. I would like to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to send me your questions either via the Q&A or the chat function of Zoom, that I can either forward your questions to our panelists or I will unmute and call you that you can ask your questions in person. I also would like to remind you that the event is recorded and it will be available online at the YouTube channel of the German Marshal. Having said that, Jonathan, probably we should start with the US perspective. Should Central and Eastern European partners expect a new US approach or probably even a new US strategy toward the region? <clears throat> What will be the cornerstones of the new Biden administration's CEE policy? And will there be a new lens through which Washington is looking at the region? Over to you, Jonathan. You have the floor. Thank you. And, and Daniel, just thank you for the opportunity. Good to be with so many colleagues. Um, and uh, obviously, this is a really important topic. I, I think it's actually appropriate that you're having this today. Um, uh, after the Warsaw Security Forum, uh, concluded yesterday. And I think it's, this is a good add on. I'm making a plug for the for, for you to go back and take a look at at the sessions that took place over the last couple of days, because I, I think a lot of these, um, a lot of the questions that we're asking or, you know, that which that you just posed to me or, you know, ones that were, um, or, you know, some of it, which was addressed partially yesterday, but it also I think magnified when we have um, some people keep people connected to the, the new president elect, and you also have uh, you know, those that are still in, in office. And, and I wanted to just start a little bit with this because I think it's really relevant to the discussion that we're having for those that are viewing from, you know, from Central Europe and Eastern Europe um, that are looking out. And then also as policymakers here are thinking about, about the region. So I know this is a sort of a two-way exchange uh, with experts uh, speaking about sort of uh, what they think uh, the administration might do or should be doing in the region. So I'm looking forward to that. So I just wanted to start off by saying that, you know, we still have until January 20th before we have, uh, you know, a new administration in place. Um, and so I want to make sure that we don't lose sight that, that Trump is still um, at the helm of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Um, and, and, and when I say at the helm, you, you know, you still have the various actors and players. Uh, I, we saw yesterday uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy uh, Steve Began at the State Department speaking about 
China, which I'll talk a little bit about because it, it is it will undoubtedly be a top priority uh, for the U.S. Uh, in in Central Europe and in Eastern Europe, but with frankly with European allies um, as a top agenda item. Uh, but I think this is an important factor when we speak about policy right now and policy formulation. Um, we still see you know a president that is terminating he calls termination uh, of key key U.S. officials, including at Department of Defense. Uh, we saw the announcement about troop withdrawals or uh, troop, uh, a certain amount of troop withdrawals from Afghanistan, Iraq, a firing of the person who was responsible uh, for overseeing at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, our efforts to fend off foreign interference um, in the U.S. elections. <clears throat> so you're still seeing an administration that's incredibly active, and I think they all have an impact on uh, policy, including in this region. Uh, and we also saw just yesterday, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in Georgia. Um, and we'll come back to the, to the Caucasus region and, and sort of US policy and strategy there. Um, and, you know, why did he make that trip to Georgia right now? Um, and what does this portend for US policy in the region as we see this transition? So we're still seeing uh, key aspects of, of the transition that are being blocked right now. Um, transition team can't get in to meet with State Department colleagues or uh, defense and security colleagues to begin to unpack what's taking place right now in terms of policy and what will come next. So this slowdown in transition right now, uh, and I expect, I don't think anybody expects that this is going to end, you know, uh, until January 20th in some manner, um, is impacting the ability for this administration, a new administration, to kick off right away and be able to, to get into the weeds on issues um, that everybody cares about. With that said, I expect you know, such issues um, as you know, a defense posture review. Uh, this is particularly important for Europe uh, when we talk about Germany, when we talk about Poland, when we talk about uh, Eastern partners. And I expect that <clears throat> part of the review process and a transition is to take apart policies in Poland or individually or regionally and try to reconstruct to see if they're moving in the right direction <clears throat> or if they meet the objectives or the priorities of a new administration. And I think right now we're st they're still in that process. But some of the things that you know certainly important for, for everyone to you know to, to take into to take into mind too is you mentioned that I worked on the Hill previously. We also still have unresolved uh, Senate races. And the balance of the Senate, which is really important for U.S. foreign policy based on who gets to be Secretary of State, who gets to be an ambassador to a country uh, like Hungary or Poland, and, and specifically those two countries where you've seen uh, uh, you know, uh, non-career uh, ambassadors in place, maybe some that have little to no experience in foreign policy or that are more closely aligned with the president. Uh, those are going to matter, you know, who gets put in place. And I expect Biden, uh, you know, a Biden elect to, to try to find the right people to put in, into the right places in these capitals. But I also expect him not to go out and try to undermine uh, U.S. ambassadors in countries like uh, Ukraine, where, you know, the administ previous this administration right now is willing to sort of roll under, you know, Masha Yovanovitch and, and, and other U.S. ambassadors. So it's important to keep an eye on the balance of power. Um, and U.S. Congress has played a major role in Central Europe. I think it's particularly important for this because uh, for the last several years, uh, when you looked at Congress, there's been increased concern about backsliding of democracy. Uh, you've seen in cases where Congress is ahead of the U.S. administration in terms of uh, putting in, trying to put in resources to support civil society. Yes, on one hand, there's strong support for the bilateral security relationship. I don't see any changes there. But it's about this issue of backsliding and about democracy that I think is particularly important. So what are we going to see in terms of immediate change uh, in between a Biden elect administration and Trump is a couple of things. One, there's there, there will certainly be a tone change. Um, I heard, you know, you speak to the Biden uh, people or you hear them speak. It's a lot more about uh, specific changes to policies. It's not just going to be uh, tonal changes. It will be qualitative. Um, and what we're talking about is going back and to relook at some of these things like defense posture uh, and deterrence. Uh, what we're also looking at is, uh, you know, issues of, of democracy and governance 
Um, and I think when you think about Biden as a person, uh, what you know about him is that he's somebody who, who's got deep experience, probably more experience in foreign policy than any US president uh, has ever had. But he's also been somebody in terms of Europe, he really embodies the ideal of, of, of a whole of a Europe whole free and at peace. He's a, he was a champion of NATO enlargement, EU enlargement. Um, and you know you hear over and over again that from day one, the first thing that he wants to do um, is repair damaged relations with European allies and then strengthen NATO. Um, and, and, and this is an opposite. This is why it's not just tonal, it's qualitative too, because it's so opposite of how Trump has approached allies, how, uh, you know, which I call bullying more than anything else. And it doesn't, on one hand, the, the 2% issue, which keeps coming up, will continue to come up, but it will be a different manner. And the, the issue of 2% should not be the only issue on the table uh, as we speak with European allies. So I expect that he's going to seek to repair relations with the EU. Um, you know, I would add the UK to that list in terms of, and he had a very positive call already with Boris Johnson. And I, I do think that the US, one of the things that we lament is as the UK has pulled apart from Europe, that the US was nowhere to be seen in terms of, of, of trying to keep the, those partnerships together in a more significant way. It may not change the negotiations, a very difficult negotiations, but it's important. But it really matters for engagement in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, because you know when we talk about things that are, are qualitative differences, uh, we're talking about about democracy and we're talking about human rights uh, and you can see it already in biden's um, outreach to a number of leaders including merkel partners in asia and in europe you'll notice in every one of the statements he uses the term you know uh, strengthening democracy um, i think it's a very deliberate language that you're seeing and i think it applies to countries like hungary i i don't expect there to be a roll, a you know, sort of red carpet rollout for Viktor Orban in Washington. That doesn't mean that the U.S. will, under a new administration, won't engage. Of course, but the tone, you know, that tone will be different. The discussion, uh, the uh, willingness to speak directly to uh, these challenging issues will be there. And I'm, I'm hoping, and expecting that that when the president elect, you know, brings everybody together for the for a summit of democracies. Um, that we are willing to confront internally within uh, the NATO alliance, um, as well as within the EU, uh, sort of corrosive backsliding and what it means for the, for the strength of the alliance. And NATO is a good place to be doing this as well. It's embedded within NATO uh, democracy and, and the need you know, for member states to uphold, uphold these values. So when we talk about this, it's important. One of the things I, I think we have to sort of even step back to is, you know, uh, how Europeans should understand how Biden is approaching it, what's what's factored. Biden often talks about, uh, you know, a fight for the soul of America during this campaign. And I, I think many of you, you know, may have picked this up, but um, I, I really think that the U.S. has gone through, and I think this is how Biden is approaching this, through a, a political moment where those within the Biden team um, look at the threat that almost came to fruition with Trump had he won again. So I think uh, Biden views democ democratic backsliding as existential to, to US interests. Like it, it, it's, it's something that's, it's different than it was four years ago under the Obama administration to today. And, and meaning that um, when you have somebody trying to tear down US democracy internally, um, he's not only projecting sort of saving the soul of of, of America, I think he views this globally. I really do. I, I think it's it's very fundamentally different in terms of language uh, approach. Now we the devil will be in the, sort of the details of what comes next, but I think the experience that we've had in the United States based on just not only uh, COVID, uh, not only democracy backsliding, but COVID-19 and the failure to respond and the impact for him um, looking at what's taking place in the United States and what has gone on, I think is going to be something that will be driving his policy. And, and that's why when he starts to look at policy, and you're going to see in this region, it's about um, how to engage autocrats. What are these driving forces uh, globally and how can, how can a new administration address these issues? So there hasn't, you know, there's, as I mentioned, there's been no American president who's had his background. So I expect him to deploy 
um, you know, across the world, both, uh, you know, development, defense, um, uh, diplomacy in a way, and also reinvigorate um, the U.S. apparatus. Let's not forget, there is tremendous amount of both fatigue internally in U.S. departments and agencies. We often talk about the issues of, of you know, the infrastructure of U.S. of U.S. institutions. Um, the morale is incredibly low in these in these places. I think what you'll see is a re reinvigorated State Department. Uh, reinvigorated um, U.S. assistance to U.S. aid and Defense Department of people who want to reinsert U.S. leadership globally. Um, but I think one of the other things, even for this region and elsewhere, is I think he comes at it from a very humble space, meaning that you have to not only engage, but you have to sort of reestablish trust. Because I think what we see from the European side is the discussion about European strategic autonomy. Can we trust the United States? What happens in four years? You know, who would come next? Um, and I think there's a lot. Of, I mean, I think it's a it's a good question for people to be addressing, including you know, in these spaces. So I wanted to just you know sort of start with just talking a little bit about what's 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 happening internally. But what I see for particularly, we just starting a little bit with Eastern Europe, and I'm not going to go too deeply into this, um, is you know the U.S. has had a strategy of of you know, it's not an Eastern partnership strategy, uh, but it's one of, of strengthening and supporting the transatlantic integration of countries um, in, you know, in, in, Eastern, in Eastern Europe. The world that Biden left in 2016, at the end of 2016 in Eastern Europe is vastly different than the one that he's dealing with, uh, that you know, he'll be dealing with today. And so when we look at countries like Ukraine, of course, there's gonna be strong US engagement and support for continued uh, engagement. In fact, when, the, when uh, President-elect Biden spoke with uh, Chancellor Merkel, that was one of the, the key, key topic areas that they focused on is how do you, you know, was Ukraine? And so uh, what you'll probably see is a continuation of strong US assistance and support for democratic uh, reform within these countries. Um, I expect that it's likely to be a more focused, uh, a more focused effort because what we've seen over the last couple of years is is that U.S. has drifted away from pushing hard on issues of of reform, and right now Ukraine Ukraine is in a very difficult place uh, based on uh, President Zelensky uh, decisions that he he has made, a rise of uh, you know a renewal of power of. Russian proxies uh, and, and others. So I think what you'll see within that context is a broader strategy on continued integration. Uh, some people have asked the question about NATO and the EU, you know, when they ask the United States, of course, the US can support greater integration. It's up to the EU to make a decision about, you know, who it, who it uh, integrates. But I expect that the US will be a vocal um, advocate for countries if they meet the right standards and I'm talking about these issues of democracy and governance uh, that need to meet, you know, that, that they have to meet those standards. So when we look there, Belarus, um, I was talking to York uh, earlier about this. I don't think there's been a, a you know, it's, it's quite extraordinary to have a candidate uh, for president um, several weeks ago actually weigh in, um, in in the manner that he did in, in terms of Belarus. I, I, I do expect that there's been an absence of US leadership Look, let's be clear, uh, President Trump himself has little to no interest uh, in, in you know, Eastern Europe. Um, there are people within his administration um, that I give credit for, for keeping the policy and process moving forward. Steve Began, people at USAID, others that have been working in this region, but the president himself, uh, Trump has no history involvement except for maybe in Moscow, and sort of uh, having a, a beauty pageant and trying to get a Trump Tower placed in in Moscow. So the the, the substantial difference is that you actually have uh, you'd have a president who actually was there. And I happened to be in the previous administration, Obama administration, where I saw Vice President Biden firsthand pushing hard on combating corruption, on addressing the the deep challenges within the country, but also being there as a partner uh, with the Ukrainian government. So we'll expect that. And I expect that in Belarus. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from Jorg uh, and others on this, is that um, you're going to see from day one uh, U.S. leadership at, at a different level. Uh, the Biden administration 
is already and, and those that are around him and he's got a great team of people that have already been you know that he's already consulting uh, you see uh, really you know this is a group of veterans of people that have worked at both in this region uh, and globally um, and so one we should take a lot of um, solace and sort of hope in terms of who's going to be joining that team because it's not just about the president it's about those that are also carrying out the policy as well but I expect that 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 Biden who has pledged to work more closely with the EU uh, more closely with NATO partners will want to be in lockstep with the EU moving forward and I expect that they will be looking at how to support uh, the Belarusian people um, how to strengthen the uh, civil society uh, independent media but also I imagine that you're going to see a much greater effort by the US diplomatically to be involved to try to find a way forward. It seems for many outside externally that the US um, at the highest level has been largely absent from uh, these issues, including in, uh, in the Caucasus region. When we think about Nagorno-Karabakh and the, the most recent settlement there, the US uh, was largely absent. Now that some people might be very happy with that, um, that may be for the better uh, in some cases, uh, but I think that, that absent that leadership, um, the US and the EU and Europe are, are weakened in terms of the ability to have an impact. And I expect that, that, that a Biden administration will focus in a way to help build up uh, cooperation and ability to, to, address, these, to address these issues. Um, just just to close because I want to you know uh, I think it's important to kind of move into the to the other speakers as well and I don't want to dominate the time too. Look, I, I think we're you know um, I think that that Central Europe um, the one thing that I, I do know is that uh, Biden values uh, relationships and allies and he was there when when uh, the countries you know Poland uh, when Hungary when. Uh, Slovakia, when Bulgaria, Romania, when these countries were, were, um, you know, became NATO members and EU members, he was on the front lines supporting these countries, but, but he supports people. <laughs> and I think he recognizes when we talk, whether we're talking about a country like Turkey too, which, you know, this discussion didn't necessarily focus on Turkey, but I think it's a, it's a good point of view is that I think he understands that there are different um, strains of policy that no country even internally is monolithic, um, that there are different voices. And I think he will be open about engaging these different voices uh, and making certain that US diplomacy is not only thinking regionally, but it's also thinking locally. Uh, and I, I think you're gonna see this in terms of probably a first budget when that comes out, uh, hopefully sometime in February, where you're gonna see a very contrasting difference between the increase in funding levels for assistance um, and for security in a manner that recognizes these challenges. And just on Russia as the last conversation, because I think we're, we're trying to cover a large geographic space. Um, you know, I've heard, you know, some people say, well, you know, uh, Russia didn't really interfere and, you know, maybe uh, in, in this election in a significant manner, I think maybe it was more about the US doing a much better job in this election, despite the best efforts of President Trump to ensure that Russia didn't play uh, the same role that it did in 2016. Um, I think Eastern and Central European partners and allies, whether we're talking about Georgia, or whether we're looking at Ukraine, uh, should should uh, should understand that this administration is 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 understands, you know, the challenges posed by Russia in in the regions, and will be there to work with allies and partners. So let me look back to you, uh, Daniel, and looking forward to the conversation as we, we speak. Uh, Thank you that. so much, Jonathan. Uh, Michael, I think it's fair to say that the issues at the heart of the US Central European uh, relations are security and defense. Uh, what can the partners expect from each other at the field? Can the expectations fulfilled at all? And, and will the change in the White House have an impact on the security infrastructure in Central and Eastern Europe? And probably, last but not least, an issue uh, which was touched upon by, by Jonathan. How is the appetite and the support for more EU strategic autonomy in Central and mm. Eastern Europe? Do you have the floor, Michael? Great. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, and thank you very much. It's great to, to, to talk together with Alina and York and, and Jonathan, it's great to, 
to hear from uh, from Washington DC. So I'll try to I, I'll try to answer your questions on security and defense from Central and Eastern Europe perspective, looking a little bit also from from Warsaw because a lot has been happening here, and also connect to the to the themes that were raised by by Jonathan because 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 it's. Uh, basically, in response, and and please, uh, Daniel, let me know. You know when to when to uh, make sure to to keep to that to the time. I'll also keep my time. Okay. So um, you mentioned in the very beginning that in most of the places there was a sort of a sigh of relief uh, in Biden's victory. Uh, my country, Poland, and a few other places. Have the, the sigh has not been as clear or at least not as uniform uh, because we are very polarized and the, and relations with the US have become a polarizing issues also within our uh, societies. So some people were very relaxed uh, and happy. There were actually fireworks in, in, in Warsaw while others uh, were not as happy um, uh, really enjoying the four years with with President Trump, and perhaps also not being entirely. You know, there was a bit. There is a bit of a narrative uh, whether the election is over or whether we, and whether there is a clear winner or whether we have to still wait for the final results. But why is it? Why are um, the government, in particular, uh, uh, not? crying or not being super happy with, with Trump going away. And to a good extent, it has to do with the deep security and defense cooperation that Central and Eastern Europe has seen in the last four years. So let me just start there and then we'll move to, to Biden because, because to, to cut story short, there is a, a lot of hope for continuation. Um, what we have seen over the last four years is basically a greater presence of American boots on the ground. Now, it has not started with President Trump, but it's been largely delivered by, by Trump. It has started very much with Obama-Biden administration, and the big changes started with the Warsaw Summit in 2016. There are a couple acronyms I'm going to throw out there, but you know, US is present in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe in much greater terms uh, than, let's say, six years ago. First, through the enhanced forward presence, this is the NATO presence. Um, Americans are core of the presence in Poland, but they are also present in, in, in other places, including uh, in, in, uh, in Romania. Um, Americans, and that's in Poland, it's about 1,500 troops, 1,200 to 1,500 troops. They are also present through a, a European deterrence initiative uh, that's actually much greater. This is also an idea that was started by the Obama administration, but then was implemented by Trump. That's additional four and a half thousand troops that rotate through the whole uh, flank. And then lastly, uh, Poland specifically, that's a bilateral agreement, and has, say, has just signed and ratified enhanced uh, defense and cooperation agreement. So we have EFP, EDI and EDCA. Uh, so anyways, lots of E's. Uh, but basically, the last four years have been good uh, and, uh, and, and has, has seen a deepening of the more bilateral uh, security relationship. So there is, a, there is, first of all, you know, when Jonathan was talking about um, a posture review, there is certainly hope that the posture will not be diminished and the hope doesn't come from the, uh, you know, from wishful thinking. It's more, more comes from the conviction that the current posture basically reflects American interests, and uh, and uh, and I think that's a right, roughly right, uh, right assessment given the uh, threat that revanchist, aggressive Russia is posing to NATO, and we are basically frontline states. So continuation. Uh, secondly, um, there is actually a joy uh, when it comes to hope for the future of NATO. As Jonathan mentioned, as we all remember, President Trump uh, is someone who said that NATO has been obsolete. Um, uh, he questioned Article 5 commitments. 
um, there is certainly hope, and I think again, fair expectations that this is things of the past. Uh, even though President Trump has been lately more um, positive toward NATO, saying that you know it's thanks to him that we see greater spending in Europe and uh, move in uh, move on um, burden sharing. We certainly hope in Central Eastern Europe, as it is throughout Europe, that Biden's administration will never um, question Article 5, that there'll be less transactional approach uh, toward NATO. And that's a good thing for Poland. That's a good thing for Baltic states and, and everyone else uh, in the region. The third point is um, hope, expectations, again, I think you know roughly uh, right assessment uh, that there won't be any sudden changes on U.S. policy toward Russia. Um, this would, you know, uh, President-elect uh, Biden has been very clear uh, and outspoken on the in, in critical critical terms of what Russia has been doing, uh, annexing Crimea, what it's been doing in Donbas. He's talking about approaching Russia from a position of strength. He's talking about, he's been outspoken, frankly, much more uh, on both Ukraine and Belarus when it comes to Russia meddling. So, so, uh, uh, so uh, and, and he seems to also, we remember, as, as Jonathan mentioned, his involvement in um, uh, promoting the vision of Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, we very much remember here in Poland his um, commitment and his work in enlarging NATO and in, in including um, uh, Poland and the rest of Central and Eastern Europe in NATO. So all this goes in a direction of, uh, of expectations that this administration will be strong on uh, Russia. There are some signs that give us a little bit of uh, worry uh, that's the debate that we are seeing within uh, Washington, within the Democratic Party, and maybe Jonathan can tell us a little bit how representative it is. But for those of you who follow this, this debate very, very carefully, there has been the, the, the letter of 103 experts and back and forth in political that is talking about maybe not a reset with Russia, but a new opening with Russia. So, so here, basically, hope for no sudden changes uh, when it comes to policy toward Russia and, and also deeper um, consultation. Um, the fourth piece that I wanted to mention uh, in the last three minutes is this, is what, what Jonathan also talked about in, in quite uh, detail. So uh, Biden and Biden's administration focus on democracy and democratic rules because of the, and purely from a security point of view, let me put that hat on, um, uh, for, and that's actually across the political spectrum, even on the opposition side. So of course we are deeply, deeply polarized. You can see this on the streets. We have, we have uh, the, there is a deep disagreement on what the government is doing domestically and there are deep worries um, about backsliding of democracy uh, in uh, Hungary, in Poland, a few other places as well. So, uh, but looking from a political, from security point of view, uh, I would say both, certainly within the government, but I would say these voices are present also on the opposition, opposition side. There is a hope that, um, that there will not be a linkage between uh, talking firmly uh, on democracy, but not uh, being, you know, focused on democratic norms, but not necessarily link it with the security deployments. Now, I expect that uh, to impact, of course, the temperature of our relationship. Um, a, as, you know, Jonathan mentioned Hungary, but I also would expect that maybe not as many um, trips, not as many White House visits, would be also with, uh, with government of Poland, but there is a hope that this linkage will not be a firm linkage. Um, this, is, uh, this is something to, to, to you know, what, what, has been, what has been mentioned by a few of the advisors of the, of the Biden's team. Um, the very last, last piece, uh, and you, um, well, the question of European strategic autonomy is something to you, you, you also asked about, um, and, 
here, the, 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 this is the, my very last piece uh, point, is that Biden's victory has really opened up uh, this debate uh, again in, in Europe, um, with President Macron making a strong case that Europe needs to have not only its own capabilities, but its own also strategic culture, and therefore push in the direction of stra European strategic autonomy. Now, there are disagreements over what this autonomy means. Does it mean ability to act or is it actually autonomy from, from the US? The very different view is in uh, Berlin in the, in the defense ministry with Ataka's recent speeches emphasizing uh, European capabilities, but within NATO, within transatlantic framework. Now, Poland is the third piece of the puzzle because it really is between Paris, Berlin and Warsaw that this debate with, uh, on European um, security will be most uh, uh, felt. Um, and uh, and in, in Warsaw, the position, even though it's not very pronounced yet, is much closer to what Akaka is, uh, is saying. But this will require Europeans to step up in much greater degree than it has been uh, so far, mostly on capabilities, uh, including uh, on greater uh, other Europeans' presence on the Eastern flank. And uh, I actually personally see this as an opportunity for, for trilateral cooperation between Poland, Germany, and the US. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Michal. Um, Alina, President-elect Biden provided a deep insight in his foreign policy plan and aspirations when his Why America Must Lead Again essay published by Foreign Affairs in January. Uh, and a significant part of his essay was devoted to the restoration of commitment to democracy, both home and abroad. And Jonathan also uh, reinforced that that will remain a, a solid fundament of uh, the future US foreign affairs. Uh, from your perspective, what can civil society and independent critical media in the Central and Eastern European region realistically expect from a renewed US democracy assistance? And what impact could US assistance programs bear on the quality of democracy in Central and Eastern Europe? Over to you, Alina. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for, for putting this, uh, uh, this debate together. I will speak not only about civil society and independent media, we will also speak about societies because it's, it, it's important to keep this, this larger context in mind. We can't just talk about CSOs and not talk about you know, citizens. Um, to, to add to what Michal was saying about how, the, how these elections have been received, how the results of these elections have been received in, in Central um, and Eastern Europe, when it comes to societies, the first thing that is, is easily to notice, and civil society as well, is deep polarization. Some people were very happy that Biden was, uh, is president-elect. Some people were very unhappy that uh, Trump uh, has, lost, uh, has lost elections. And there are very, very um, deep conversations uh, on you know, why Trump was better, why Biden is worse, Everybody in this region has a stake in this American elections and they have been passionate about it and they are deeply polarized about it. That's, that, that's the first thing that is, important, that is important to say. The second thing when it comes to democracy assistance in this part of the world, and I, maybe Eastern Europe is more important um, than Central Europe in, uh, in, in this, at least it has received larger amounts of, of you know, democracy assistance, is that the last four years have not been that bad. And they have not as they have been not as bad as everybody feared and expected, mainly because of the Congress. The Congress has always been there throughout um, each of Trump's attempts to cut back on democracy assistance, to cut back on assistance in general, not only democracy, um, and to you know to, to do to do away with uh, with other good with other good initiatives. The Congress has been extremely important in keeping the flag up, and that's why uh, that's why it hasn't actually been. Uh, as bad as everybody expected when it comes to numbers. However, it has been very bad. It has been disastrous uh, when it comes to example, to the example that Trump, his administration, um, and in general, the states um, have actually been uh, put forward 
um, when it comes to democracy and when it comes to what democracy looks like and when it comes to what democracy acts like and when it comes to what demo you know democracy behaves in this region in Eastern Europe, but also in, with, with with Poland and Hungary in Central Europe as well, you have you have people who believe in other models of societies, other models in, uh, of government. You have people who are nostalgic about authoritarian governments. You are people who are agnostic about democracy. Um, you have people who don't trust democracy because they don't understand what the heck this is, this is all about and what to do with it. And when you have four years of this thing in America, this thing going on in the States, the model of democracy, the model of a democratic society doesn't seem appealing, doesn't seem convincing, and doesn't seem to be functional. So that has really, really complicated matters uh, for you know, democracy assistance and demo democracy workers when it comes to promoting democratic ways of behavior, democratic ways of government, um, separation, of, uh, separation of powers, um, you know, all of these good things that uh, we have been talking about. So we do have a, a clash of, of beliefs and we do have a clash of models, which has been um, enhanced by everything that has been going on in the uh, in the states over the the, the, the past four years. Um, so, what should change? What we hope it's going to change in order to uh, well, with the Biden administration, in order to make things better, obviously, because that's that's the whole idea. Uh, first of all, the rhetoric will change. We'll have a we'll have a, a, a president who will behave. Well, normally for a change and democratically um, um, as well, which will really set a very, very good example of how leaders should behave in this part of the world and, and not only. And it's example really that it's the most powerful. It's not only, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the lessons that you, that you read in books or what uh, democratic activists tell you. Then we also have, we also have a better promotion of values. Values are being forgotten. Values are being forgotten uh, in the region, values are being forgotten in Europe. And don't forget that here we have a very strong Russian and now Chinese influence who um, um, are infiltrating societies with different values. So we'll have a new conversation about values and we'll have values being put back into the center of you know, democratic, uh, democracy assistance. Um, then we'll have a, 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 we hope we see, uh, a tougher stance on, on illiberal tendencies and illiberalism in general. And this will really help um, all democratic activists in, in, in the region because what we are fighting with, what we are fighting against, it's really um, deeper belief in illiberal uh, attitudes and in illiberal values. So a good example from, from the states would help us uh, you know, turn this turn this around to a certain to a certain extent, and hopefully we'll have a reduction of of conspiracy theories and disinformation with a, a decreased number of tweets, um, which will really help um, settle the 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 informational sphere, if you want, put it somewhat back into uh, into order to the extent that this is possible. Because right now there, there is there is people are asphyxiated with uh, with information. Um, there are things that will not change. I do not believe, I, I don't know who said that, either Jonathan or Michal or maybe both, um, said that the um, United States is going to be more politically present in the region. I don't believe this is going to be the case. I think the United States is going to be pretty consumed with everything that's going on internally, unfortunately. And this will, uh, will uh, continue to leave a void here in the region, which will be filled both by Russia and China, hopefully European Union, but less likely. Um, so I don't think that's, that, that, that that's going to happen. And last but not least, what we really have been waiting for, what is it, three decades now, um, is a stronger economic presence, American economic presence in the region. I don't think this is going to happen either, both because of what I mentioned earlier, all of these internal um, you know, pressures um, in the United States, but also the crisis. There is an economic crisis, which is only going to get worse. So I doubt that um, you know, in, the, in the next four years, we are going to see a lot of American uh, business uh, floating to the region as much as, um, as, as, as we would like it uh, to see. Um, and last but not least, really one minute, um, there are fears here in the region within the civil societies, within societies that the Biden administration would bring back or bring back to the table a reset with uh, a reset with Russia. 
Um, as much as this is talked about, I doubt, we don't believe that this is uh, really going, going to happen, but there are, there are messages uh, coming from Moscow as well. There is disinformation, there are spins coming from Moscow that a reset with Russia is something that, you know, Biden administration is considering. Um, and we should be more careful in, in, in more active actually in countering this kind of, uh, this kind of information. Thank you so much, Alina. Uh, Jörg, the region where the Trump administration's foreign policy has been perhaps the most underperforming is what from a European perspective is called the Eastern neighborhood. The relations with the Ukraine were instrumentalized for domestic political purposes. Trump blackmailed Kiev with the suspension of military assistant, assistance and, uh, and Washington, as Jonathan uh, already mentioned, remained at the sideline in recent crises like Belarus or Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, how should a Biden administration address similar potentially emerging conflicts in the neighborhood region? How should the US address the Belarus crisis, which will most likely remain on the agenda in 2021 as well? And adding, the, adding a question what we already received uh, from one of our attendees, can you imagine a US foreign policy strategy towards these partners in the region Ukraine, Georgia, for example, which which is an independent foreign policy strategy and not subjected to the U.S. relations with Russia. Over to you, Jörg. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I will get to those questions uh, uh, in a minute, but I thought what, uh, what might be worthwhile doing is pull together a couple of the things that, uh, uh, that my colleagues have all basically indicated. And I think there's, there's three pieces to this. Um, perhaps the first of these is, uh, uh, hasn't been mentioned as much, but is worth sort of uh, pointing out. Um, what we see at the moment is an interesting sort of contrast. Uh, on the one hand, you have the US elections in the last couple of years, which basically showed how resilient American institutions are. Um, despite all the upheaval, I find it interesting to, to see how the institutions are basically holding up against this pressure, whether it's broadly the electoral process, whether it's institutions that are being dragged in at the state level, whether it's eventually the court system. I find it interesting to see how resilient the institutions are, because if we look at Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we generally have a weakness of institutions. Uh, where in the US uh, over the last years, uh, the, uh, the administration uh, and now also in the electoral process, Donald Trump didn't really man manage uh, to bend institutions to their political will. Uh, this is the standard uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this is where institutions are basically be, uh, uh, being bent constantly by, uh, by political power holders, um, I mean, Poland is certainly a very good example. Hungary is, uh, and further east, you, uh, um, you obviously have the same, uh, that institutions are basically sort of uh, play toys for, uh, for power politicians. Um, I find this interesting uh, uh, as, a, as a contrast uh, because it basically also means that in whatever the US uh, does in Central and Eastern Europe, I think it should put a much stronger emphasis on sort of strengthening also, also institutions in the region, uh, whether this is uh, obviously the court system and the entire rule of law aspects, whether it's uh, elections, of course. So I think there is a, there is a conclusion even almost from the, from the US election for the, for the region, not only for the US themselves, uh, that is, uh, a, a stronger uh, sort of impulse, uh, a, a taking more seriously of, of core institutions, procedures and, uh, and standards is, uh, is in order and should certainly also be reflected in some of the, the approaches and the assistance, especially that the US uh, uh, may be giving to, uh, uh, to the region in the, uh, in the years to come. I think the second and also evolves around a bit of a contrast is and has been mentioned that if you look at the last couple of years and US engagement in Central and Eastern Europe, what you see is basically a, a sort of realpolitik uh, uh, above everything. Um, it was basically a, an engagement that typically was framed by security concerns as important as they are, uh, um, by geopolitical concerns, so rather, um, uh, rather keep countries 
uh, close because there is Russia uh, that that needs to be countered. But typically, that also came at a, uh, at a blind eye to domestic developments. Um, we've seen this in Hungary. We've also seen this further east. So um, this was basically a putting on a pedestal of, of a realpolitik, of a geopolitical thinking only. Uh, and any domestic developments and dynamics were not only secondary, but they were basically not considered at all, in my, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and this is and was indicated something that uh, that I think many of us expect to uh, to change to get into more of a of a balance again, uh, and obviously also relates to the to the first point that I mentioned that it's not all about hard security and uh, uh, further east also conflicts, but it's also about the long term sort of building and strengthening of institutions that can uphold uh, a sort of peaceful. Um, uh, functioning of uh, of societies and politics in the uh, in the region, um, and the third point is, and again, a bit of a contrast I find. Um, has something to do with the contrast, obviously, between the, the US and the EU. I mean, if we look a bit historically at Central and Eastern Europe, then typically uh, you had a pretty close sort of lockstep and coordination when it comes to, uh, to developments, to assistance in Central and Eastern Europe uh, between the, uh, the US and the EU. And that obviously completely crumbled in the, uh, uh, in the last couple of years. I mean, it was rather a, a hostility between the US and the, uh, and the Western part of the of the EU um, than than any cooperative uh, format, and what this leads to then is that it creates spaces for others, um, either for those who who undermine uh, joint rules, um, whether it's the rule of law, for instance, or more broadly also human rights, uh, or when uh, when it comes to Eastern Europe, you see spaces emerging for. Uh, for other players in the region and, and beyond. Um, I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the, the settlement or whatever uh, we may call it that's been reached, uh, uh, completely took place without the, uh, the engagement of, uh, of any Western institution, country, individual players. I mean, it's basically something where, where both Moscow and Ankara want to show us we don't need you, we can handle these things ourselves. So uh, I think what's, uh, what you have there is the, um, the emergence of, uh, uh, of spaces if there is a withdrawal uh, first by the US and to some extent with it also the, uh, um, uh, the European Union. So what I would hope here is that uh, a stronger engagement uh, uh, also helps uh, close some of those uh, some of those spaces that make for uh, more often than not negative developments in the uh, in the region. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, to some of the questions that were uh, that were asked, I think the first uh, and the most important question here for me is uh, whether or not the Biden administration will develop uh, uh, some own policy towards uh, uh, the Eastern European neighborhood. Um, Personally, I think they shouldn't. Um, I think they should develop a policy that uh, uh, is again in uh, in sync and in coordination with uh, uh, with European approaches to the region. Uh, certainly, EU policies can be uh, and should be uh, uh, improved, made more efficient, uh, and so forth. But I don't think there should be an own US policy necessarily. I think we need something that is uh, broadly a, a Western policy of. Uh, of reassurance, of uh, uh, of assistance to the region, also to of uh, sort of development assistance and democracy assistance to the region, rather than something on its own. Uh, and the uh, part of the reason uh, I think I gave already that um, I think Central and Eastern Europe has, has typically mostly benefited if there was a joint approach by the U.S. and the uh, and, and Europe uh, to this uh, to this part of the world. Um, and the other reason is obviously that the US will be eternally, uh, let's call it distracted by a number of things. Uh, one is obviously dynamics in its own country. Uh, um, uh, another is obviously China. Um, the Eastern neighborhood of the EU is a principal concern for Europe, but not for the, uh, for the US. Uh, so keeping the US uh, sort of involved here uh, is certainly best done by a, by a joint policy that in many ways is also carried uh, primarily by Europe and, and uh, uh, requires less of a, of a permanent investment presence uh, and political capital by the, uh, by the US because 
I think it is unrealistic to think that uh, that the Eastern European neighborhood will ever be a, a principal concern of the uh, uh, of the U.S. Um, I think we have to be realistic there, given the um, the number of other uh, uh, crises and, and global challenges that uh, that there are. Uh, when it comes to Belarus, I think it's a bit early to to say some of these things. I think what was notable uh, in the in the last three months was that uh, um, with all the the limitations that there were, the EU was uh, uh, was pretty present. Uh, the EU responded fairly quickly um, uh, and very regularly, also uh, convened and tried to respond to the crisis. Yes, we all noticed the uh, the very difficult discussion and delayed introduction of sanctions. Uh, but the EU, nonetheless, was was pretty present throughout this, um, and probably more so than uh, than also some in Minsk would have uh, uh, would have expected. Uh, by contrast, the US was pretty absent. Uh, I think it took the Secretary of State about a week uh, to uh, to say something first about uh, about Belarus. So, uh, in that sense, I think uh, uh, this shows, in a way, um, uh, how how very absent in many ways the, uh, the US uh, were from, uh, from these emerging crises. Uh, Narona Karabakh was the other, other example mentioned. Um, but it also shows how, first and foremost, uh, this is a neighborhood of, uh, that the Europeans need to, uh, need to engage with. Um, the, U, uh, the US, I think, can have an, uh, a supportive role here. They can have an amplifying uh, role also on the political level. Uh, but first and foremost, I think it is on the uh, on the Europeans uh, uh, to respond here, um, and I don't think this is uh, uh, this is going to change. This again is also a um, a matter of whether you call it burden sharing or division of labor. Uh, this should be this should be natural amongst partners, and I think some countries uh, here again, uh, more specifically on Belarus, uh, some countries in Europe are filling these shoes. Um, whether it's Lithuania, whether it's Poland, um, some others in Central Europe have uh, have been extraordinarily um, uh, engaged on the uh, on this portfolio and in response to the to the developments happening there. Um, whereas again, others in Europe, including Germany, were were much less closely engaged here. So I think it's more a matter of uh, uh, sort of within Europe uh, getting more concern raised for this part of Europe and more willingness also to engage both politically and materially uh, than it is to uh, to expect this from the US, which, uh, as I said, um, should and will have more of a, of a supportive role here if we can get back to some form of transatlantic sync on, uh, on this part of, uh, of Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jörg. Ladies and gentlemen, the Q&A is open. Please submit your questions either via the chat function or via the Q&A. And uh, we already received a, a couple of questions. And if you allow me, I would bunch together three or, or four of them. Please feel free either address all of them or, uh, or just uh, pick one what you find the most interesting. I would like to, to start uh, with the question of Pavlina Janebova. Uh, that uh, the Trump administration provided high-level political support for the Three Seas Initiative, which I think was widely, very positively perceived throughout the region. What can be expected disregard uh, from the Biden administration, either particularly concerning the Three Seas or generally, generally uh, minilateral regional formats in, in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, a second question, would be that if you allow me, I would like to open a your points for for a, a, a wider discussion. Is uh, an intense coordination regarding uh, the Eastern European region between EU foreign policy and US foreign policy feasible? First of all, from from a US perspective, and uh, completely agreeing with with Jörg that it's not necessarily a question of primal importance for, for the US. What can be the added values of US diplomacy in this game if the coordination indeed uh, took place? Uh, we get a couple of questions regarding democratic backsliding, uh, autocratization, and especially the situation in, uh, in Poland and Hungary. And I would uh, 
sum up these questions in, in the format that what do you think? Can the US through an intense engagement and democracy promotion split these authoritarian twins in, uh, in Central Europe? Because definitely the security dependence of Poland from the US is much larger. Therefore, the US leverage on Poland is much more objective than, than in the case of, of Hungary. And what we see, even in these very minutes, that uh, the existence of two authoritarian states can even block and, and freeze completely the EU institutional structure. So from that perspective, a US engagement being a game changer would be, I think, even a huge added value for Europe. And I don't know how do you see uh, these opportunities. And my very last question would be, and thank you very much for Alina and Jörg uh, to putting China uh, on the table. The, the most important demon of Washington throughout the last two years was that, uh, that Central European partners refrain from embracing Chinese 5G providers. But what we see is that irrespectively from the political pledges of certain governments, simply telecommunication companies are limiting the share of Huawei and other Chinese hardware uh, in, uh, in their networks. So practically the US demons are increasingly fulfilled. Um, what, can be, what can be the next angle or the new lens through which the US will perceive Chinese influence in the Central and Eastern European region? And will the China question play an increasing or a decreasing role in the US-CE relations, especially again with eye on the fact that what we see is that the 5G questions probably will lose importance. So thank you very much. And probably we can go in a reverse order. So you're, you have the floor. <laughs> Jörg, you are muted. Okay, now it should work. Uh, perhaps starting in reverse order with uh, with questions with uh, with the China one, uh, with the caveat obviously that I'm not an expert in uh, in China, uh, but. I wonder whether generally the Belt and Road Initiative will uh, will come under much more uh, assault uh, from the from the U.S. Um, because it does create a um, a dependency again um, and a very very strong and one sided one. And it may be a slightly uh, sort of unfair comparison, but if the U.S. zoom in on a pipeline project like Nord Stream two. Uh, which does create uh, dependencies, political leverage, pressure on uh, uh, possibilities for Russian pressure on uh, on countries, then basically, logically, you cannot leave something like the Belt and Road Initiative untouched because it does exactly the same. Uh, so in that sense, uh, and here again, this comes from a lay person on, uh, on China, here I would wonder whether or not this is, uh, this is an initiative that uh, will see much more uh, sort of criticism and perhaps even pushback by the uh, uh, by the United States. When it comes to the uh, to the added value that the U.S. Uh, uh, can have in Central and especially also Eastern Europe, uh, then I try to to say something uh, early on on this. I mean, uh, obviously, it can amplify uh, concerns um, uh, over the development in the region. Uh, uh, certainly in the case of individual countries like, uh, like Poland, um, I would say that the EU have a degree of credibility that any form of criticism that the, uh, uh, the US have a, a degree of credibility there, also because of its security engagement and guarantees there, uh, that's uh, criticism that comes from the US over issues like the rule of law, for instance, will probably be taken more seriously uh, than if they come from Brussels or uh, individual European partners uh, in the in the EU. So I imagine there could be a, a complementarity uh, here um, when it comes to uh, keeping or committing countries also.
read uh, to, for instance, standards like uh, like the rule of law. I also think there can be a sort of division of labor when it comes to, for instance, sanctions regimes, because we know how difficult this um, in the case, for instance, of Belarus, we saw that uh, how difficult it is for the EU to agree on uh, on a sanctions regime. Uh, it gets even worse uh, when you talk about economic sanctions. Uh, the U.S. seem to be less reluctant uh, to roll out sanctions, uh, sanctions uh, regimes. Uh, they're also more proactive when it comes to economic sanctions. So I could very well imagine that a complementarity in relation, for instance, to a country like Belarus uh, looks like this, that the EU on the sanctions end does what uh, it can, uh, requiring the political consensus that it needs to, uh, but that additional and perhaps more biting sanctions are being in, uh, include uh, being introduced by the uh, by the U.S. in pursuit of exactly the same, uh, let's say, political uh, demands. Um, I could imagine that uh, that this sort of complementarity division of labor uh, could, at least to some extent, be re-established, and uh, this way it would uh, would amplify uh, concerns that, uh, if pursued, or criticisms uh, that if pursued individually by only the U.S. or only the EU, wouldn't have half the effect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, here. Alina. Uh, yes, thank you. Let's start with a, with a three C's initiative. And there's recently, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, um, a, a resolution on the three C's initiative has just been adopted in, uh, uh, in Congress. Um, this is very much a Congress deal and a Congress uh, business um, um, as, uh, as it is the, uh, uh, the administrations. So um, as long as the Congress continues to uh, tilt towards democratic component, um, I think the three C's initiative is going to be pushed forward, is going to be put forward, what, and politically it's, it really has been embraced, uh, you know, um, upfront. Uh, what I'd really like to see and what everybody would really like to see would be some funds being put behind this initiative, not only by the United States, but most importantly by, by Europeans. It is, a, it is an European initiative um, after all. So beyond and behind, uh, you know, political declarations, if funds are there to, to, to support the projects, the 100 and some projects which are included in the initiative, uh, that would be much, uh, much better. When it comes to coordination between, between US and EU, I know this is not very, you know, this is not public knowledge and it hasn't been a, a, a widespread information, but throughout the four years, there has been very, very close, I might say, uh, coordination between US and EU when it comes to democracy assistance in this part of the world. And we saw people in the European Commission uh, as well as people in the, uh, at USAID really working very close together to, uh, to, to devise strategies, mechanisms, tools for, for civil societies in this part of the world. So coordination has been there even in tough times. I believe it should be there and will be there in, um, in, uh, in easier times. This is uh, when it comes to democracy assistance. Politically speaking, it's a much more uh, complicated deal. Um, can the US split the um, uh, authoritarian twins, um, meaning uh, Hungary and, and Poland? I will let Michal delve into the, you know, into the Polish question and he's all eager to do it. Um, on some issues, there are more than only two countries, you know, taking um, um, anti-liberal or um, European skeptic positions. There have been there have been times when all the V4 Visegrad four countries plus Romania have taken positions which were against what the rest of the European Union wanted. So it's not that easy. It's not a duo necessarily. On certain issues, there are more there, there are there are more than two countries. Which, which behave, uh, well, let's simplify it un improperly. So this is much more difficult to, to split than, than, uh, than only Hungary um, and, and or Poland. And I, so I don't think US can actually do it. It's, it's as much as they would like, but I don't, think, I, I don't think they will have it on their agenda. I don't think it's up to the US to actually do it. It's up to the European Union and the commission to, to do it. Uh, when it comes to China, listen, there are two, there are two developments that are extremely worrying, uh, worrisome uh, in the region when it comes to China. First, that, and that should be stopped. It should be stopped by, a, by, a, by, a, by more coordination and more active coordination between EU and, and, and the US. And first of all, this is um, economic financial investment 
in, uh, in strategically important points of economies in the countries in the, uh, uh, in the region. Um, ports, um, refineries, different, different uh, railways, so different uh, investments, which, uh, as I said, which, which are not only financially um, sizable, but they are very strategically important for the respective countries, and they are now being uh, being taken by uh, by Chinese by Chinese companies. This should be stopped. This should, this should be better looked at, better analyzed, and and this should be uh, put a halt on. But the second thing, which I find even more I find it more worrying because it's much more difficult to, to tackle to my mind. It's the fact that China offers an alternative model of uh, government and society. Um, and this is very clear after they've just had their Congress and they've put forward their five-year uh, five plan, you know, free market for not free people. Um, and this is a model that some people believe that uh, should be embraced. They would like to see uh, prosperity, economic prosperity, but don't care that much about, about democracy. So offering this model um, I've, and, and put it forward in the region, I think that's, uh, that's the most um, dangerous um, you know, contribution of China. And this should be tackled much more seriously, both by the US um, and by the EU in, um, in, in offering an alternative, not only offering an alternative, but making the alternative much more, um, more, much more attractive, speaking more about the, the attractiveness um, of the other alternative and being more resolute when it comes to really um, you know, stopping uh, Chinese and Russian disinformation. Thank you, Alina. Micha? Let me start on an easier question. Let me start with the three Cs. Uh, so, I, 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 you know, fully supportive of what Alina just uh, said. I mean, there is a one, uh, for, first of all, there is a hope that the initiative will be continued. There is uh, the recent um, resolution, yesterday's resolution uh, was sponsored by uh, Representative Captor, a Democrat, uh, has gathered bipartisan support. So there is clearly a hope that this is going to be by uh, bipartisan um, initiative. I think it's, you know, it started, the, the Three Seas initiative has really has gone through quite a transformation. What started with uh, quite a bit of geopolitical tint, uh, with a big uh, summit and support from, from President Trump has now been embraced, not only by countries in the region, but also uh, by countries like Germany, who very much would like to join and is right now an observer. So I think the, and the focus has been very much the uh, economic rather than geopolitical. The trouble is what uh, Alina mentioned. So, so actually having more funds and concrete projects. That is literally, I mean, it's still very much a political project rather than concrete project that that should be focusing on infrastructure and uh, and economic cooperation northeast in uh, Central Eastern Europe. Um, but there is actually an, an important link, and, uh, and that's something that you know we've heard uh, President-elect's uh, advisors talking about as as three Cs being a sort of a counterweight to a Belt and Road Initiative in the region, and and here is the link to China. I think this is this is the lens through which at least I'm seeing right now. Jonathan can can you know can can uh, address this. The U.S. Um, Biden's administration might be viewing this. So a greater involvement of U.S. would actually be um, uh, in, in this infrastructure programs and projects would be a counter to Belt and Road Initiative and to some extent also the 17 plus one initiative that is largely actually not as popular anymore. And I think so this is to answer you know, one of your questions, Daniel, about uh, China, and it is going to be a key uh, issue for the whole transatlantic alliance, of course, also in, in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. But I think this three Cs would be an interesting uh, mechanism through which to, to, to focus on it outside of 5G, which will remain there. 
Then the question about uh, democratic norms, leverages. Uh, let me just say that I, 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 I uh, being a Pole, living in Warsaw, I, I do not like the autocratic twins uh, description. I know that my government not doesn't necessarily always help with uh, this this picture. Uh, and in fact, we have real uh, challenges and problems as you I'm sure all can see, but I would push back a little bit on the degree of problems. Um, and, and, and I think actually very much in Polish national interest and government interest should be to distance ourselves from, uh, from uh, Hungary, both in European context, but also in transatlantic context. I think it's just a bad thing for, for Poland to be in the same boat uh, that, that Hungary is, and sometimes even uh, you know, Turkey. So, so anyways, but that said, the question whether there will be a leverage, whether there, there's gonna be a more of an influence from the US. Tricky, uh, and we'll see. First of all, it has, you know, as York said, the approach from US until now to Central and Eastern Europe was all about real politics. Yes, ambassadors have been talking about it, but issues of norms, democratic norms have just not been on the agenda at the highest level. It's been not talked about. Now it's clearly going to be talked about. Now, is it going to be talked about in private or is it going to talk, be going to be talked in public? Here, I think US will be faced with playing a, a, a tricky balance if they want to actually have influence because this issue is not going to be a, just an international issue. It's going to be very deeply domestic issue. Uh, in, it's um, domestic in a way that any public statesman will gather very quickly a domestic uh, dynamics. And uh, frankly, because of, without going into questions, but the, the, the domestic situation here is so uh, hot and so not only polarized, but actually, you know, the, the government doesn't have stable majority that I, I actually don't see an easy way out if they are faced with uh, pressure that, that doesn't offer them face saving solution. Now, in private, I think that's exactly absolutely uh, right. Uh, and here is the question of, of, of linkage that we talked about at the very beginning and what linkage US is willing to use and what linkage uh, US is not willing to use. Yes, US is going to be by far the most influential player, uh, including in countries like, like Poland. Um, because of the importance of the of the of the relationship, I think it's going to be a careful dance to really uh, shift policy here. Um, uh, uh, just the public criticism, even though warranted and applauded by about half of the society, uh, I think would not bring not bring uh, a change in, in, in policy by the by the government but very very tricky i'll stop here thank you michael for the clear words jonathan over to you yeah um just on three c's initiative thanks for pointing out the the congressional passage of legislation yesterday there is strong bipartisan support um, i expect that the next administration will <clears throat> excuse me share that support but i also um, I worry a little bit about the, the funding levels. As, as you may recall, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Secretary Pompeo, a little over several months ago, promised a uh, billion dollars for infrastructure projects. Uh, and a, lar a large part of that would go through something that was, um, was established through the De uh, Development Finance Corporation which was established during the Trump administration. So I think that that number alone, that billion is why well, welcome, is, is small potatoes. If you wanna have an impact in infrastructure, you have to have uh, much deeper pockets. Uh, hopefully the US can use this initiative, but I expect that there's other ways for the US, uh, at least in Central Europe through the Three Seas Initiative 
um, to look at economic projects, energy, north-south pipelines, ways to sure up energy security, and then increase engagement uh, economically. What you want to see there, some of them are in, in dire straits. I think we haven't talked too much today about COVID-19 um, and the economic recovery um, that's going to be needed in countries that are in deep recession. And so the U.S. can play a role along with Europe uh, and, and, and sort of being there to provide support to countries that are, that are harmed economically uh, through the IMF, World Bank, uh, through EBRD, uh, through, through U, uh, EU instruments in combination to help countries get back on their feet and also work with those countries to ensure that there's a vaccination plan in place uh, so these countries can, can hopefully uh, knock one for all of us that so we can move COVID. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Trump chose to not, you know, to, to, to try to make it about America first versus America. And it's world together. It's a global pandemic. It needs a global response. So I think we should be focused on that conversation. I think that is tricks to this USA and EU mechanisms. Um, I, I think that they're a, 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 a EU for Europe and Eurasia. Um, and I've often thought that there needed to be a structure like NATO. A North Atlantic Development Organization that it was an equivalent in some sense to the coordination that we see on defense, but unfortunately we don't see it um, on development in a way that we that we need to. But there is coordination, and frankly, there is coordination even at the State Department level. Um, but it needs to be stronger. Just on Russia, I, I don't see there being any reset. I just want to, you know, I, I I don't see that happening. Um, you know, Putin is coordinated as, you know, will be in power for the next decade. Uh, he's coordinated himself through faulty, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, referendum, uh, you know, that, that didn't receive even a peep from this, uh, the Trump administration when it happened. Very little from Europeans as well when that happened as well, when he coordinated himself through this process. Uh, but the corruption, um, the activities of, of Putin, I don't think anybody, anybody believes that there's a strategic change in Moscow coming. And I can't imagine that this administration coming in would think uh, anything but Putin remaining a challenge and problem. It's a much deeper conversation to be had uh, to go through this uh, and more nuanced. So just, uh, just on Hungary and Poland, I just want to point out on Hungary, I think the things that are most challenging, and I think even uh, the Trump administration understood this at the end, was the relationship between Orban and China uh, and his relationship with Moscow. And I think this is a very distinct from what you see in, in Poland um, and, and those challenges. And I think that will influence uh, how the US, US will approach and this administration will approach uh, Hungary uh, and Poland. Nonetheless, I agree uh, that, that there will be, uh, my colleague Moore said that they will be nuanced in thinking about how best to do this based on what's taking place domestically, which, you know, that the U.S. must pay much greater attention to what is happening in countries, what people want in these countries as well before shooting off its mouth or making a policy determination, something Trump was only willing to do through, through Twitter or calls that nobody knew took place. And I think there'll be a very big difference in tra transparency and approach. And just on China, um, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, this, this will remain a top there has to be greater transatlantic policy. Um, and it reminds me too, just the China policy for the U.S. under Trump was a lot, you know, it's just, it was, you know, it was about, uh, you know, sort of lots of uh, sticks, but very few carrots. Um, and it came off as, as bullying uh, country. So I expect that this administration will be more nuanced. Uh, my hope and what we'll likely see is more action for the U.S., EU, and, and European countries, because Europe isn't just the EU. They'll have to deal with each individual EU member state um, on these issues. But I expect that, that there will be more efforts in multilateral forums across the UN, in the WTO, um, that are likely to 
uh, be where some of these battles with China will take place uh, over, over values, norms, um, and, and an expectation maybe on the trade side, the one area where I think we can see imp maybe improvements is through a revival of something like TTIP, which is you know, something that would impact US trade with all of, all of Europe, but also to help set standards and norms, regulatory standards that are really critical as we, as China tries to impose what Alina talked about was sort of its norms or how it wants to impose a sort of market economy without democracy. And so, and, and my last point on this too, and I think is really important is uh, the US needs to, you know, and I think will work to strengthen uh, in-country knowledge, including across Eastern Europe and elsewhere as, you know, to better understand China. I think there's a lack of expertise uh, in many countries, including even in the United States uh, in understanding how China operates um, and giving uh, civil society, giving uh, you know, the populations, the understanding of what it means to enter into a port deal with China that may be corrupt or how China is undermining liberal democracy. Uh, both China and Russia, there's no change in that strategy. They both have a strategy of undermining uh, liberal democracy globally and then also, um, also undermining transatlantic unity. And that's something that, you know, I think this administration will focus on and push back. Thank you, Jonathan. We have a couple of minutes left and Michal have to leave earlier. So therefore, I only would like to uh, to give just one question for you. And I don't know who would like to address it. There is a region not necessarily we could open this this geographic uh, discussion in Central and Eastern Europe, where both the US and the EU traditionally uh, prefer to support stabilocracies. And that's the Western Balkan. And, uh, and the question is whether a new approach by the Biden administration can change or alter this policy and push the region towards a more genuine democratization or, uh, or the preferences will still remain. That would be our, our final question. Uh, I really uh, excuse myself because a lot of questions remain unanswered, but we are running out of the time. So I don't know who would like to answer. I mean, I can answer just quickly. I, I... <clears throat> two of us, I expect, uh, you know, it's been pretty clear that that uh, uh, President Trump in the Balkans has um, has deviated from a, a cooperative approach, a transatlantic approach, particularly when we talk about Serbia and Kosovo. Um, I expect that, that this administration, a new administration, will be spending much more time to closely align uh, policies with uh, with Brussels rather than sort of opposite of how Trump has approached uh, these issues. And it, it, not that, that within the Trump efforts that there aren't good things to pull out. And I, I just wanna say across the board, I hope that the next administration takes the, whatever good they can, you know, things that, that are in US interest, but also advance you know, objectives that they keep in place some of those policies. I expect that will be the case, but the Balkans is one area where, um, where you really uh, saw that divergence uh, sort of directly um, at a very high level um, and, and also trying to use um, the Balkans and it's sort of the settle this agreement that was reached for political purposes back in the U.S. to show that Trump is this, you know, this leader that can can address these problems. I mean, the, these issues are very difficult, the continued Euro-Atlantic integration of these countries addressing democracy. It won't be easy but it will be much better if we're dealing with, with the democracy issues, but also the greater influence of Russia, China, Turkey, um, and these other, other, you know, other actors, uh, if, if the US uh, is working together with, with its transatlantic partners, I expect that the Biden administration will. Thank you, Jörg, would you like to add something? It relates to that point, but it uh, it uh, sort of goes beyond it. Uh, I mean, my understanding is uh, that the Biden administration is going to be a one-term presidency. I think we should also keep our uh, expectations at bay here uh, uh, in relation to what you can do in a single term. I think uh, there will not be uh, this will not be an administration that can can really sort of kick off and also see through uh, major 
strategic shifts, uh, adjustments, reorientations. I think in the first place, this will be a, a, a presidency that may repair some of the things that have been that have been undone in the last years, and not just in Central and Eastern Europe, but in places like NATO. Uh, so I don't think this is going to be a presidency necessarily that uh, that can create major uh, sort of new uh, steps, strategies, and so forth. So I think uh, we all would be well advised to sort of keep our uh, expectations not low, but at least uh, realistic here, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, this is a this is a four year period now where uh, perhaps some things can be uh, can be fixed that were damaged badly over the last years, but the, um, it's not going to be a leap, as it were, uh, for the region of Central and Eastern Europe and probably beyond. Thank you, Jörg. As we are running out of time, I would like to say a big, big thank you for your extremely valuable insights and, and a great discussion. And also many thanks for you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us today. Have a nice evening and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.